from experience. That verse and that song have gotten me through the hardest times of my life. And I always turn back to them when I need hope, when I need my faith renewed, and I need inspiration. And I hope that uh, this morning that those words brought that hope and that faith to you as we are reminded in God's Word. You know, we want to talk this morning about our friends and our family, bringing family and friends to Christ. We are in a situation now where people are spending time with their families in ways that most of us probably don't normally do. We may not be particularly used to it. And, um, you know, and, I, and I've actually, I've, I've heard some people talk about, well, it's just too much time with the family. I even saw one preacher talking about how people are going to despair and, and families are going to break apart because they're spending too much time together. And I, I just don't get that. I don't understand that. I don't understand that mindset. Uh, how, could, how could spending time with family be anything less than wonderful? And if it is anything less than wonderful, may I suggest that you take this time to build the family relationships that you can be blessed with as God has given. But also, when we think about family and as we think about this time, we have opportunities to reach out. I know, I know that some family members are communicating that don't normally communicate right now. They're checking up on each other. And it's not that they didn't care about each other to start with. It's just that they, everybody was living their own lives, doing their own things, caught up in their own work and their family or play, whatever it might be. And now all of a sudden, everyone is focusing on things differently. Well, what a wonderful time for us to think about sharing God's message, sharing God's word with our family members and our friends. We see a lot going on online right now that uh, it is amazing to me. When, when the, the church has been forced to operate differently, now the word of God, which cannot be contained, is spreading online in ways that I have never seen it before. Satan can't win. Satan can't win when God's people are engaged in spreading his word. I am reminded of the first century church, who when they were persecuted, fled. But they went everywhere preaching the gospel. And we are not being persecuted today in that sense, but we find ourselves with another kind of crisis, and yet I am seeing as a result of it, God's word being preached, God's word being spread in ways that I have never seen before. And isn't that a beautiful thing? There is so much to be thankful for. There are so many blessings to be found. Folks, we will choose what we focus on. We will choose whether we focus on fear, whether we focus on the negative, or whether we seek to make the best of a situation and glorify God in it. And I am so thankful that so many of my brothers and sisters in Christ are choosing to glorify God at this moment. Now, how do we reach out to our families and friends? How do we take advantage, maybe, of this opportunity to be doing what we should have been doing all along? As we are refocusing now, let us focus on evangelism. Now is a time to evangelize. Now is a time to spread the borders of the kingdom. Now is a time to reach out to a world that is fearful and show them hope. To reach out to a world that feels tossed by the storms and show them the one who can calm the storms and who has. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Now there is a message of hope and also a message of dread in this passage. The hope is that we have a Savior to save us from our sins. That he has gone to prepare heaven for us. 
And he has commissioned us as his children to spread the gospel message that man is lost in sin, but Jesus died to save us, and there is a way to come to him that he has prescribed, and that's the gospel message. There is hope in that. The dread is that if we do not do what he said to do, then souls will be condemned because of our lack of faith, because we did not carry the gospel message. And so we need to remember that hell is real. Everybody wants to talk about heaven, but nobody wants to talk about hell. We need to remember that just as heaven is real, hell is also real. And if we have family members, if we have friends that are in danger of going to hell, it is up to us to take to them a loving message of the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ and share with them that gospel message. And what a time we have now to do so. You know, Jesus said to go into all the world, but the world starts at home, doesn't it? The world starts at home. And as, as a, a husband and a father, I want to be sure, I am compelled to be sure that my first priority in life is to get my family to heaven. That means I start by setting the example before them. That means that I teach them. That means that I lead them. That means that I do whatever I must to be sure that my home is a sanctuary from the world. It is a safe place, and it is a place of faith, and it is a place of love, and it is a place of peace. When your home is like that, then being home isn't a chore. Being home is a blessing. You know, we must evangelize. And that, that, uh, that means simply to spread the good news. And the good news if, is the gospel. If we do not, souls will be lost. Jesus said, he who does not believe will be condemned. That's a horrible thought. It's especially horrible when we think about our family and friends. But love demands that we reach out to them. Somebody says, but, but I'm afraid that if I reach out to them, I'm afraid that if I try to share the gospel with them, that they will reject it. I'm afraid that it'll create tensions. And it might. Even with the best of motives, even with a, the kindest of attitudes, it might. But folks, that's fear. Fear cripples. Fear keeps us from doing what God said to do. We need to be motivated by faith, not fear. And when we think about the truth of the matter, that hell is real, it ought to compel us to reach out to those that we love. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? If their soul is lost, can you bear the thought of on the day of judgment... Your friend that you saw on a regular basis, your co-worker that you worked with on a daily basis, your family members looking at you and saying, why did you never tell me? Let me sing the song. You never mentioned him to me. You can't make the decision for your friends. You can't make the decisions for your family members. You can't make the decision for the stranger that you meet on the street and try to share the gospel with but you make the decision as to whether or not you share the gospel. And that is what our Lord has compelled us to do. We must do that. And when we have done that, we have done what we can. Let us, as Philip did, run to the chariot. In Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39, we have this occasion where the Ethiopian eunuch had been to Jerusalem to worship God. He was a religious man. He was a sincere man. But he was someone who did not know the gospel of Christ. He did not know Jesus. Now, he was sincere, but he was sincerely wrong. And there may be many people today who fit that description. That they're sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. Philip had, had had much success in preaching the gospel in Samaria and the whole city was won to Christ and the whole city was baptized into Christ and it would have been easy for Philip to stay there and relish in that. 
He could have had what many would call today a mega church. The whole city of Samaria. But he was focused on preaching the gospel. And the Lord called him from the many to the one. And I love that because it shows the importance of one soul. It shows how important to God even one soul is. If we do not know the influence that this man who was a, a, a man of authority that he had when he went back to Ethiopia. But we know that for the sake of one soul, Philip was called from the many. And he saw this eunuch, this Ethiopian in the chariot, and he ran to him. He saw the urgency of the moment. He knew he couldn't let this moment pass him by. And so he ran to the chariot. Brothers and sisters, we need to run to the chariot. We need to see the urgency of the situation. When we have the opportunity, we must not let that opportunity pass us by. We need to run to the chariot. The eunuch was reading a suffering servant passage from Isaiah about Christ. And he didn't understand what he was reading. So Philip asked him if he did. And he said, how can I accept so man should show me? And he invited Philip into the chariot to, to explain to him the scripture. And the Bible tells us that Philip began at that same scripture and taught unto him Jesus. And folks, maybe, maybe we need to refocus. Maybe we need to refocus. There is a time, there is a time to discuss certain venues, there's a time to discuss certain situations, there's a time to discuss certain doctrinal matters that may, may be matters of distinction between us and others, but we have to start here. When we start there, we're getting the cart before the horse. We need to start with teaching Jesus. Now what does teaching Jesus mean? Well, we know that Philip began at that scripture and taught unto him Jesus. The very next verse says, They came to a body of water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest, thou mayest. He said, I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he commanded the chariot to stop. And Philip took him down to the water. And he baptized him. Now here's what we know. We know that teaching Jesus involves teaching someone to be baptized into Christ. Because that's exactly what, what happened. Philip taught unto him Jesus. And by teaching Jesus, he knew he needed to be baptized into Christ. Start where people are. He started at that scripture where the man was. And he taught unto him Jesus. You know, sometimes, sometimes we want to start with people where we think they should be. And we have to start with people where they are and help them get to where they should be. And we need to be kind and compassionate and gracious and understanding as they develop their knowledge of the Word of God and their understanding. Even after they're baptized and they start to grow as babes in Christ, we need to be patient with them. Start where they are and help them to get to where they should be. It's a family affair. Evangelism is a family affair. In Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 26, we find Aquila and Priscilla. And they had the opportunity to teach a man named Apollos. The scripture says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. 
So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. There's a full sermon right here in this passage. So here is this man who is a Jew. And he is fervent in his belief. He is a believer, but he lacks knowledge. Again, he is sincere, but he still needs to be taught. Notice that Aquila and Priscilla, as a husband-wife team, took him aside and explained to him the way of the Lord more accurately. It's a family affair. Husbands and wives with our children at times. Uh, you know, one of, one of uh, my greatest joys is to have one of my sons, and this actually happens quite often, I'll, I'll get a text. I'll be going about my day, and I'll, be, I'll get a text, and there'll be a question. How do I best explain this? Or how can I best answer this question? What verses will help me to talk to this person about this. And I love that. And whatever I'm doing has to stop. I don't care what it is. Whatever I'm doing stops because all of a sudden that becomes the most important thing for me at that moment. It's a family affair. We are involved in this together. Let us work together to bring souls to Christ. Notice also that Apollos, Apollos was a man who was fervent in what he believed, but he still needed to be taught the way of the Lord more accurately. What was it that, what was it that he was not accurate about? He only knew the baptism of John. And the baptism of John was no longer valid because it had been replaced with the baptism of Jesus. The baptism that Jesus had commanded, as we saw at Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Where Jesus gave the, told the commission, gave the commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He didn't understand that and he needed to know that. He needed to be taught that. <clears throat> In India... Many times we have the opportunity to take someone who is religious, a preacher who is religious, maybe preaches at a church but is not preaching the full gospel of Christ and doesn't understand the baptism of Christ. And we take that preacher aside and we'll teach him and he's baptized into Christ. He rejects the doctrine of man, he's baptized into Christ and then more often than not, leads the whole congregation into Christ. It's powerful. God's word is powerful that way. If you go to the next chapter, you see Saul in Acts chapter 19. He meets up with some disciples, but they don't also understand baptism. They believe in Christ, but they don't understand baptism. They also had only been baptized with the baptism of John. And so Saul taught them the way of the Lord more accurately. And they were baptized into Christ. Isn't that beautiful? You know, sometimes folks say, well, you don't need to be baptized to be saved. Baptism isn't essential to salvation, but you still need to be baptized. And I scratch my head and I say, why? And I say, well, to follow the example of Jesus. Did you know that Jesus was baptized with the baptism of John? And we have two examples that we've just seen where the baptism of John was not sufficient. Jesus was not baptized for the remission of his sins. He had no sins. But he commanded you and me to be baptized for the remission of our sins. 
Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the Holy Spirit brought the words of Jesus to the apostles. And when they were asked in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, men and brethren, what shall we do? The answer came back in verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, my friend, and I say this with all the love in my heart to those who are listening online, I say this with all the love I have in my heart, and I mean that. That if anyone ever tells you that baptism is not for the remission of sins, turn to Acts chapter 2 verse 38 and decide whether you're going to believe a man or to believe the Bible, an inspired man who spoke the words of Jesus. Turn to Mark chapter 16 verses 15 and 16, and read the words of Jesus himself. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. The light figure wherein to baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. How in the world any man could read those scriptures and then be so bold as to say baptism is not for salvation, I do not understand. Yes, Apollos was instructed in the way of the Lord more perfectly. He was teaching the wrong baptism. We need to be sure that when we teach the gospel, we get it right. We need to be sure that we're teaching the whole counsel of God. How do we reach them? How do we reach people? How do we talk to them? It's not an easy thing, especially family members. Especially family members. That can be hard. Well, first of all, we need to be kind and considerate. Listen, you're not in this to win an argument. You're in this to save a soul. And if you're in it for any other reason, just don't. You're going to do more harm than good. But if your objective is to save a soul, if your objective is to help someone better understand the gospel and lead them to Christ, then do whatever it takes to do so. Listen first. Save your advice for later. The very first thing you should do when you begin to study with someone when you begin to, to teach the gospel to them and share with them, it's to let them share first. The very first thing you should do is ask some questions about them, their salvation, their faith, their belief, and then sit and listen. Let them talk and listen. Don't assume that because this person is of this denomination that they believe this and then just go into condemning that because you've assumed that's what they believe. You're, that may not be what they believe and even if it is, that approach is quite often less effective. Listen first and save your advice for later. Do not argue. Don't. Again, you're not in this to win an argument. If the other person only wants to argue, they're not ready to listen. You've done your part. Love them, leave the door open, and move on. Again, by arguing, you can shut a door that may never be opened. You want to leave that situation with the door open so that you can come back in. There may be another time. There may be a time that's better, that's more productive. Don't get involved in arguments. Avoid trick questions. Once someone becomes defensive, and it's a scary thing, understand this. It is a scary thing to have what you have been taught and believed all of your life. To be confronted with the gospel, with the word of God, and start to realize that maybe what you believed wasn't in keeping with the word of God. Do you think that's easy for someone? That's scary. 
You're taking that person's, that person's faith and just, just pulling the rug. You're not. The Word of God is. And sometimes that has to happen. And I understand that that can be painful and that can be scary. And they may, they may, on an impulse, attack because they're scared. Understand that. Be forgiving and be compassionate about that. Do not get involved in trick questions. For example, well, do you think I'm going to hell? Well, do you think you, you folks are the only ones going to heaven? Rather than tell what you think, and quite often when I'm asked a question similar to that, my response is, you know, what I think really doesn't matter. I, you are not going to be saved or condemned based on what I think. Let's just, let's just go back to the Word of God. And let's see what the Word of God says, and then you make the decision about that. You see, if you will lead people to the Scriptures and let the Scriptures convict them, instead of telling them what they need to believe about the Scriptures, it'll be far more effective. Be consistent in principle and practice. Be careful. Sometimes, sometimes people use maybe phrases that they've heard and maybe they're not consistent. They'll apply it here, but they won't apply it there concerning the Scriptures. We need to be sure, first of all, that we are consistent with the Scriptures. That we follow whatever we're approach that we're giving to scriptures, that interpretation, that we follow through to its logical conclusion and that we're consistent in its application. Remember that conviction will win over compromise. I know, especially when it comes to family and friends, people close to you, I know that there's this temptation to compromise. There's this temptation, well, if I will go with them, if I'll be a part of what they're doing. Listen, conviction wins out over compromise. If I find out, if you're trying to tell me that what I believe is not, is not right for somehow, and you're asking me to listen to what you believe and what you teach and what the scriptures say, but I find out that you are not convicted on that, why in the world would I want to change where I am convicted to be a part of something that you're not showing conviction in? When you start compromising, you start losing your credibility. Conviction wins over compromise. Be genuine. Be real. Be loving. Be an example. Show them first. Once you show them, you can start to teach them. Keep in mind the power of your influence and guard your influence greatly. Beatrix Potter said, I hold that a strongly marked personality can influence descendants for generations. And that is so true. What you do today is going to affect generations to come. What you do in your family, in your home, with your family, outside your home is going to affect generations to come. Your influence is powerful. Be sure that you protect it. If you would control how you influence others, control what or who influences you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 33 says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 2 and 3, You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us. Written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. You are an epistle of Christ that others will read. What are they reading when they see you? Remember who does the saving, and remember who does the judging. Neither is you. The saving... It's something that Christ has done and will do as one comes to him and obeys him. The judging is something that the Bible, that God's word has already proclaimed and will ultimately be given on the day of judgment. Again, remember that your influence is powerful 
and soul-saving, guarded. It's not limited to example, but also to teaching. Jesus said, go, preach the gospel. We are told in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The power is in the gospel. Know and share the plan. Hear the gospel. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, verse 17. Believe it. Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. John chapter 8, verse 24. Repent of your sins. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. The times of this ignorance God once winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Confess Jesus as the Son of God. With the heart a man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Notice the word unto there. Leading toward, leading to. That's not saying that when you confess that you're automatically saved. Acts chapter 8, verse 37. Again, that example of the Ethiopian eunuch making that great confession. I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Then be baptized for the remission of your sins. This is not optional. This is not an opinion. This is the command of God, as we've seen in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Romans 6, verses 3 through 4 shows us how that we are baptized into Christ as we are buried with him in the waters of baptism, having put that man of sin to death and rise up to walk a new life. Thus, through baptism, we encounter the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, which saves us. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Now, why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Would you do that today? Would you, would you stop waiting? Would you do what God has said to do? Would you be baptized for the remission of your sins? Now, what are you waiting for? And please, please don't say, well, I'm waiting for the coronavirus to end. I'm waiting for the isolation to end. Listen. There's a baptistry right here. We've already had one baptized during this isolation period. I'd love to see us baptize a hundred more. If you're concerned, if you're concerned about your life at this period of time, let me ask you this. Are you ready to go? You know what? A child of God doesn't have to be afraid to die. Death is just going home. And then, having fulfilled the command to hear the word of God, to believe it, repent of our sins, confess Jesus as the Son of God, and to be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of our sins, we must remain faithful. Jesus said, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. I would encourage you to consider your soul. And I would encourage you to do whatever you need to do to make it right with God. We have a couple of people manning the computers looking at Facebook right now. Uh, both of them are named Alton. <laughs> and good, good guys back there, they're waiting to see if, if anybody sends a request. If it's a request for prayer, we're here to pray with you for you. Especially if you want to make things right with the Lord and with his church. And if you need... More Bible study. We're here to study with you. Please let that be known. If you have a desire to be baptized into Christ, we can make that happen. So we'd ask you to come while we sing.
course of number 280, I Know Who Holds Tomorrow, and be led in our closing prayer by Joshua. I don't know about tomorrow. come to you at this time, we are once again so mindful for the things that you've given us. We know that during these times it's easy to look at the things that we, that we don't have, that we need, that are going wrong, but we ask you to keep us mindful of your love, mindful of the, the gifts, the blessings that you've given to us so much more than we deserve. We're thankful most of all for your son, Jesus Christ. And that he, the life that he lived here on this earth, and, and the death that he died for us, for our sins, Lord. We know that we're undeserving, but we're thankful Amen. that we have the blessing anyways. We ask that you continue to be with each and every one of us, all of our friends and family, especially our church family, Lord, our brothers and sisters in Christ, as we... As we continue to go throughout our go throughout our lives and, and navigate this difficult time, we ask that you help us to keep you in the front of our minds in every decision that we make. May we remember you and your love. May we show your love and your glory to other people in the way we live our lives, the way we interact with each other. Until we meet again, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.